as, this, as the presentation says, I was uh, was Tim Crom that was expected to hold the presentation. Um, very glad that I have the chance to show his great work. Uh, now, <laughs> let's see if we can manage to do so. I'm Christian Bow. I'm flexible pipe design uh, supervisor in te uh, manager even in Technip Norway. So responsible for all the flexible pipe design that Technip do in Norway. And uh, I will be speaking a little bit about uh, experience from design and operation and learning improvements and so on. Just very quickly, like the other presenters on Technip, uh, we're about, uh, well, we have, of course, expecting to be the lead world leader, uh, and we have about well, uh, 36,000 people in the 48 countries. Um, if you look at the map, uh, we flexible pipe, which is the subject of this uh, conference. We have a big uh, market in, in Brazil, West of Africa, uh, some Far East, but of course North Sea is also very, very important. Uh, we have a flexible pipe factory in uh, Malaysia, uh, one, soon to be two in uh, Brazil, and uh, the main one for, the uh, for, for Norway in uh, Latre. Norway is part of this North Sea Canada region up there. And here's uh, Norway. We are getting close to 700 people. Uh, well, yeah, I forgot to say we started in 1985. Uh, so, uh, 700 people is about 2% of the technique group. We have the main office in Oslo, getting close to 500 people. Big design office also in Stavanger. Uh, uh, the uh, Stadtholm base in Haugesund that we run for them, and the Spool base in Orkangi. Uh, this is kind of the subsea uh, ambition of the Technip uh, to, to provide uh, architecture and services, installation services, and products. Flexible pipe, which is a subject for us. Steel pipe, real pipe shown here, but we also have a uh, SLA capability, and uh, umbilicals. That's a little bit of our history in uh, Norway. I'd like to start on here. Snowden PLP was one of the first flexible riser projects in Norway, three-layer Koflon. Nune, Njord, Visun, Oskar, Valdir, and back to Snowde, foremost Norway B. That was a little bit sort of roughly the time. I think there was a little word from the beginning here about uh, flexible pipes have the same level of safety uh, as steel pipelines. Uh, yes, of course they should have. And it, 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 I mean, the safety record lately has not been great. It's, uh, we are needing to improve. But at the same time, one should remember that, and I think this was mentioned by several speakers before, that it is the major enabler for the subsea structure that we have in the North Sea today. Uh, moving from these big lumps of concrete down to this nice floating, uh, I think this is you probably, yeah. And uh, kind of showing the subsea architecture. I, I should, I'm sure you could do the subsea architecture, but the floater would be difficult without flexible pipe. There isn't, uh, for the water depths that would work in, in, in Norway, it's difficult to envisage anything else. Uh, yeah, I had looked at this slide and I thought, hmm. Maybe I would have changed a few things. But anyway, we have done uh, flexible pipes since the early 70s, that's for sure. Unbundled flexible pipes. Uh, delivered more than 10,000 kilometers, uh, 25,000 end fittings. From one and a half inch up to ah, 22 inch, I think, we have, because we have actually physically delivered this 19 inch. Uh, we have qualified down to 300,000 meter, 3,000 meter water depth, but uh, there's still some, not any projects quite that deep. And also, I don't think we've delivered anything for uh, uh, for, 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 for hydrocarbon use up to 20,000 PSI yet. Yeah, that's uh, to be done. And also this minimum temperature is uh, cryogenic uh, flexibles, which is a little bit outside the scope of this conference. But uh, we can do minus 50 and minus 30 with PVDF up to 150 degrees. Yeah. This, I think we've seen this like quite a few times today. But what you will notice is the date. It's um, 2004. Uh, so this was what 
Tim, I think, made his presentation in 2004, uh, showing that you know Norway was really at the top of what was being done, particularly in the 1990s, from this increase that Jan showed. And if you compare with the rest of the world, well, this is one of these what I call the shotgun graph, but there is a trend. Uh, Norway was at that time uh, leading on, um, on, on on pressure, but also on yeah, this was for 14 inch diameter specifically plus. And if you look at what has happened since, there hasn't been done that much that was more impressive than what was done in the 90s. Uh, we have Skype down here and we have a couple of projects in the Gulf of Mexico and West of Africa. So it may be one of the explanations, or it is one of the explanations why we see what we see. Uh, this was something else that uh, was presented at the same time. So this is historical. It's not actually what we think today. Well, it probably is what we think today, but <laughs> uh, uh, that there had been experienced a lot of incidents, uh, collapse of internal uh, layers of three lake. Uh, this was gas injection specifically, but there's something familiar there: slippage of end fittings, degradation, plastic layers. Uh, has been discussed briefly today, external sheet damage, burst of external sheet, pigtailing of flexible drag change. The last one, I think, is kind of gone because we try to avoid to do those. Uh, yeah. yeah. It says these uh, incidents have uh, led to a greater understanding of the limits of flexible pipe design and importance of control of details. Yeah, I, I hope so, but <laughs> it's not always we are that convinced about it. I'm not going to spend a very long time on that, because I think uh, Klaus presented that quite well in his presentation. But uh, basically, maybe touch a little bit on the history of the three-layer uh, Coflon design. Uh, basically, this was the only alternative when Oscar was built. There wasn't, there, there wasn't anything else. So. Uh, you could argue that if it hadn't been for this solution, Oscar wouldn't have been built as a floater. It would have been built uh, as a static platform. Uh, and the challenge has been these three layers, uh, but they were there for a reason. Uh, the layers were susceptible to creep and cracking, and uh, therefore they built them with these three layers. Um, and then uh, the additional problem was this need for plasticizer. Uh, yeah, and then he mentioned that the, if you pre deflasifies at least you solve the anything problem. But what we um, saw was that uh, there were some shortcomings in these designs. Uh, so there was some f early failures around, I think it was Christmas 1995. And then for 10 years we have been looking at a monolayer PVDF solution. Um, so it's not been a simple process, but we're getting there. I'm going to go get back to that a little bit. I think maybe I'm going to skip this one. It was presented quite well by uh, Klaus again. But um, it's the pull out of the uh, challenges. But uh, just focus on the fact that because of one of the important failure modes has the lack of friction between the carcass and the seat now because, you, uh, because of the interfaces between the plastic layers. So what the solution has been is to use uh, or to develop this uh, monolayer Coflon XD material. Um, it's uh, just it's tr extruded straight onto the carcass, uh, and uh, there's no multi-layer or, or uh, void between the um, plastic layers, which means there is no risk of uh, collapse. Um, you get mechanical link lock between the carcass and the um, sheath and the sheath and the seat does. So it means that the locking in the end fitting takes the mechanical loading. The PVDF is highly ductile, which ensures that it works even with this, considering the roughness of the uh, carcass. Um, and you eliminate the problem with the sh uh, sh uh, slippage due to sh uh, loss of plasticizer. And it simplifies design and manufacturing. There has been, and somebody has mentioned to me, to me outside, that there's been some <laughs> challenges with, uh, it says designer, but with uh, extrusion. The extrusion uh, co flow has required some, or has, has uh, meant that we had to 
work a little bit on the extrusion techniques to solve them finally, but this is solved. And uh, we have also developed through this process better NDT processes. It says here to uh, identify un unacceptable defects, but of course unacceptable defects are not specifically linked to Coflon XD. They are there when they are there. So it's the NDT that has become better through this process. Uh, and here is this uh, famed uh, test for our friends in Statoil. Uh, it was completed uh, 18th of November. Pressure test finished on Thursday after uh, 2 million bending cycles. This was the fourth test. It was tested at uh, different damage levels through the fatigue test. A test was performed at 130 degrees, more than 400 bars. The pressure was upped a little bit through the test to, to, to increase the fatigue damage towards the end. Um, and it's also run 60 temperature cycles. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think I was going to skip the rest. So this was, a, but uh, it was a very uh, extreme test and uh, it's completed successfully, we hope. The dissection is still outstanding. Uh, external sheet damage, again, been talked about a lot. Um, yeah, so abrasion is the challenge and the prevention. Uh, venting, uh, good procedures. Uh, good specification, I would say it says guide tubes here, but I say all sort of equipment that the flexible comes in contact with has to be well designed. And um, an additional protection. Uh, BP presented the additional protection they used on SCARF just to avoid these kind of things. Yeah, very. I, I think I'm going to skip through this slide more or less and just go straight on. Uh, this is the vibration, uh, the flip. I think most of you know it. Uh, it's uh, uh, led to this uh, smooth bore design which is installed on Oscar uh, gas expo system. It's installed on UA and it's recently installed on Nune. There is, has been a problem on Christine as well, but uh, they have managed to use the system the way it is. Uh, yeah, I think, I think I took this slide in the wrong order, but never mind. <laughs> uh, so this is a thing that happens with dry gas flow and uh, technique we're not 100% sure that uh, some people uh, that the, the, the challenges are fully understood. Uh, although we know that people are doing engineering on this. Here's another challenge, uh, which uh, I think was the subject of one of my questions to um, Klaus and his answer. Uh, service life reassessments is a big one coming up. Um, for us to be able to do good reassessment of your ISIS, we need good information. Uh, pressure, temperature, fluid composition, inject chemicals and so on to assess processes as aging and so on. Any uh, inspection data, findings from tests and so on. And uh, then of course this one comes up, fatigue, corrosion and so on. So. Um, The service life of flexible pipes can be extended, in our opinion, but monitoring and inspection tools is a key thing for allowing you to do that. Um, this, uh, some of the systems, I should highlight that this is just a selection of the systems that we have uh, have developed. Uh, this one here is quite. Uh, I would say standard, it's been several designs on this, is the analyst uh, gas monitoring from top side. Uh, one version of it was presented by PP. Uh, optical fibers, which can be used to uh, detect flooding, as uh, presented by NOV. Um, and and, and on-site inspection by analyst uh, testing and gas testing. Uh, we are, uh, we have a system that we have tested in uh, uh, test <laughs> in testing <laughs> to, 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 to detect uh, armor break during, uh, also from dynamic fatigue and so on, or armor break basically. 
And this system will be implemented on a platform in Brazil in the next weeks or so, is that correct? Yes, is it? <laughs> so uh, this is, of course, uh, additional challenges and interesting to see how it works in that environment. Uh, and then finally, here is a job we did specifically linked to this uh, carcass challenges that uh, that was uh, uh, experiences we were experiencing, where we were able to measure the carcass pitch and then come back to start oil and tell them whether the carcass was elongated or not. And I think quite a lot of the ones we measured were elongated. So, um, but I, I, as I highlighted, these are just some of the systems that uh, we are working on. And uh, we are, of course, also willing to work on anything else that. Uh, all companies wants us to look at. Uh, some about the thing, it's about the technical challenges and key R&D programs that we are running at the moment, or nearing completion for, for quite a few of these. Uh, carbon fiber ar armors and um, sea vaults for ultra deep water and also uh, the anchoring of armors. Fatigue and uh, corrosion fatigue, uh, they will work with the uh, fatigue curves, software and analysis, and uh, also looked at uh, reinforced uh, top rises. Corrosive fluids, uh, material qualification, prediction of analyst composition, anti H2S, uh, high pressure, high temperature, new, uh, yeah, new volt wires, polymers. Uh, and uh, new pipe designs and this thermal screen which allows us, uh, you, you saw the 150, the thermal screen allows us potentially to go to 170 degrees. Uh, flow assurance, active heating and high performance insulation, cost reduction and volume growth, always important. New suppliers and new grades, both for steels and polymers, and integrity management, as was mentioned in the earlier slides. So monitoring systems and inspection systems and services. Services, not the least. Uh, key innovations to support our flexible pipe technology. Yeah, we have been here for 30 years. Uh, smooth bore, we talked about, carbon fibers. Uh, Anti-H2S sheath so that if you have an HRS in the bore, it gets uh, eaten by this pink layer, and it is actually pink, uh, before it reaches the, uh, the uh, analyst and can um, damage the um, wires. And the integrated production bundle for improved flow assurance. So, yeah. Better design, more FAR, blah, blah. <laughs> I feel I'm looking at the thing back there, so I'm kind of running out of time. I'm okay with time. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm keeping to the 20 minutes. Come on. <laughs> uh, so, to conclude and summarize, uh, flexible products have really been essential for uh, the floating production systems we see in the North Sea. And Norway has been really at the forefront of that. Uh, particularly with high pressure, high temperature, and I would say dia uh, a li uh, large diameter. Uh, some of the solution that we adopted uh, in consultation with the clients uh, as best practices subsequently demonstrated new failure modes. So, so what was the word that we really hadn't been used too often? Was it uh, unexpected, unexpected? So that comes a second time. Um, so in, uh, extensive R&D required to design and qualify new solutions and uh, increased focus on life extension and uh, asset integrity management. Special needs uh, for focus on material degradation. And I think that was uh, Mr. Chrome's presentation. I think. Okay. Thank you, Christian, for stepping in on such a short no notice. Uh, any questions for Christian?
all from Kongsberg. Uh, you mentioned the uh, minimum temperature for the PVDF uh, layer. Uh, could you say something about how low can you go for a PVDF uh, liner? Uh, there I see sometimes there is a mismatch between the design reports and uh, what is in the TR, typically. So. Uh, yeah, and what is uh, qualified. The, the, the main challenge so far for us has been the end-fitting qualifications. Uh, the temperature limit given for the material itself has been minus 20, and we haven't had any end-fittings qualified at that level so far. Uh, now we have... <laughs> material which I think is still officially qualified to uh, minus 20, but minus 30, uh, I don't know exactly what the status is, so I'll have to come back to you on that, but the end fitting has been run from minus 30 to 150 degrees in the uh, uh, API test. And this is a sample that's been in fact through, I, I can't remember how many cycles, but it's been through, you know, 130 minus 10, and then, so, so it's seen a lot more cycles than what the requirement says. So at the moment it's minus 30. Any more questions? Yeah, I'm Errol Lacasse from SO Norway. And Christian, uh, you focus about life extensions, but we also heard this morning that 30% of the flexibles haven't reached design life and uh, for various other learnings but I'm just wondering for a product that probably has billions of dollars flowing through it all throughout <laughs> the year yeah. and when we have worked with you know four sub C trying to predict not end of life <laughs> how much life <laughs> we have we find so few so few dots by which to make pred predictions that with the levels of uncertainty we're talking about, one standard deviation or two is like 30 to 50 years difference. And, you yeah. know, as a premier producer of this, how attuned are you to the products that were released 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and where they are in their life cycle? And what are you doing, you know, to improve your understanding and support for those? Yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure exactly where to start on that. Uh, the, certainly, if you're talking about the products uh, that are in service today, we are, um, as soon as we get information from suppliers, uh, from uh, operators uh, about incidents, we have a, a team dedicated to following up incidents. So. If, if we're talking about challenges, and let's face it, these 30% are things which were not expected that happen anyway. Uh, if we have instances like that, we analyze them, and if we feel that there is a threat to other suppliers, um, other operators' uh, assets, we, we do notify them. But then going from that to saying uh, how much do we know about all the uncertainties? Also, can we predict within, uh, when we say that a service life is 20 years, whether it's for the Rilson sheath or for the um, armors or whatever it is, is it then 15 or is it 50? Uh, I'm afraid that there are, we, we have a lot of knowns. We, we know the product better than we did 20 years ago, a lot better but there are still a lot of unknowns. And I think it's one of these cases, the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. So um, I'm afraid it's not a very simple answer to your question. It's all right, mate. I wasn't expecting a simple <laughs> answer. <laughs> you wouldn't have placed it if it was. <laughs> Thank you. OK. Thank you to uh, Christian. I think we'll move on to the next uh, presenter.